So, have you got your Bibles? Have you got your Bibles? Okay, if you do, I'm going to ask you to turn back with me to the book of James. The book of James in the New Testament toward the back of your Bible, right after Hebrews. James, one of the earliest books written in the New Testament, written to believers that had been scattered from Jerusalem to other areas. So many of these, the majority of them, would be Jewish believers, but they have had to flee because of persecution. They've had to flee their homes, flee for their lives, and so they've gone out into these other provinces, areas that are Gentile uh, dominant. Many of them have lost their jobs, they've lost their homes, they've lost a lot, and they are now in a place of tremendous suffering. Many of these people are, are really poor. We don't know what poor is in the United States. Many of these people are suffering. They have had to sell themselves out to be slaves. Slavery was a real thing in the first century. It's, there's, there's no getting around that. And many of these believers had to do this just to survive, and they are wondering, where is God? Here we've believed on Jesus. We've moved from Judaism, the religion of, of all of our lives and our parents' lives and grandparents. I mean, all of them were Jewish. And now they have followed Jesus as Messiah. And they have been kicked out of their synagogues and out of their places of worship. Many of them would not have family members to speak of now other than their own immediate family uh, that has maybe come to Christ with them. So they're ostracized. Now they've lost their homeland, so to speak, and they've been scattered abroad. And James, the, um, uh, the, the brother of the Lord, calls himself a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, even though he was the half-brother of Jesus. Still, he understands, and uh, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes this uh, powerful letter. This letter has about every other verse um, on average, has uh, what we call an imperative. That's a verb in the Greek that is like a command. It's the action word. It's something we should do. So there's a lot of believing, but also a lot of doing in James's letter. And we've gone through some of these, but as we uh, refresh ourselves with James, let's just start in verse one of chapter one again, and we'll go forward and we'll read through uh, verse 15. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Some of your versions may say temptations, but the word is the same in the Greek, and the context determines whether it's a trial or a temptation. Here he's speaking about trials. He says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, remember we said double-souled, like living in two worlds, being a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. But let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position, spiritually it means, and let the rich man glory in his humiliation, because like flower and grass, he's going to pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed, so too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away." Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. And we're going to focus on verses 13 through 15. And tonight we're going to talk about temptation, its causes and its cure. 
We're going to talk about temptation, its causes, and its cure. And there's a very specific temptation that James is addressing, but we will actually open up the umbrella a little bit and cover temptation uh, in general as well as speak to the specific issue that James is addressing here. But with all that said, let's pray and ask the Lord to, to help us and to lead us as we study his word. Father, we are grateful for your word because your word is eternal. It is uh, applicable to us always. It's, it's your word from heaven it is not subject to the changing times and seasons of life. Doesn't matter who believes it or doesn't believe it. It is rock solid. It is true. It is your word and we need it. And we thank you that you have given it to us, even in book form, that all of us can read, we can hear, we can know your word for us. I pray that this word tonight from the book of James would just penetrate our hearts and our lives, that we would grow and our understanding of trials and temptations and that we would recognize what they are and how we can kind of head them off at the pass and, and deal with them in a way that brings glory and honor to you. I pray, lead us and guide us. Let us grow. Let us grow tonight. We don't want to just be challenged. We need to be changed. Do this work by your spirit as we study your word. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. And amen. So as we begin in verse 13, as James is talking about the trials of life, he does shift gears, even though the word in the Greek is the same for a trial, a testing, or a temptation. The word's the same, but the context tells us that it can mean one or the other. He switches gears here, and now he's going to talk about temptations. As we go through the trials of life, we will be tempted and specifically tempted to do one thing. Verse 13 tells us, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. Now we actually have one of our action words here uh, in the Greek. It's not going to show up for us that much in English, but I'm going to give it to you. The action word here in this portion is the word say. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Now it doesn't just mean verbally don't verbalize it. It's okay to think it and to steam. And it, no, 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 it doesn't mean that. But it means to declare something. Whether it is verbal or whether it is with your lifestyle or something that you dwell on in your mind, let no one say when they face temptations, I'm being tempted by God. Don't ever make that declaration. And we might oftentimes uh, say, well, I would never do that, but people do it all the time. And this word say here means to, to give your opinion or to render judgment, to declare something as true. And how often do we face the trials of life and then find ourselves in a situation where we are tempted in a particular direction? And we'll define temptation in a couple of minutes. But how often do we decide that God is to blame for this. God, how could you let this tragedy happen in my life? How could you allow a loved one of mine to die before their time? How could you allow a child to die? How could you allow uh, my world to be shattered? I've lost my job and now I'm homeless. Do we realize how many people because of the current economic situation, uh, not only in our country, but around the world, I'm told more and more people are actually losing their homes. They can't even pay the mortgage and they are out and they are homeless families. Homeless. They can't even, they don't have any place to lay their head. How easy would it be to say, God, you are to blame. And now I'm going to have to take drastic measures and it's your fault. Let no one declare, let no one make a judgment that when they face these difficulties of life and they are in this place of temptation, let no one say, God has done this. God has tempted me. God has brought me to this place. Let no one say that. That is our command. That is our action to make sure that we do not do that. I understand when tragedy happens, there may be momentary lapses. And we're, we're all at one time or another, we're going to say, why, God? 
That's, that's human nature, I get that. But we must not dwell on that and then declare through our lifestyle or our words or even our thought life that God is to blame and God is the one that has tempted me to do something wrong here. Never, 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 never. And James makes it very, very clear why that's not the case. Because he says God can't be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now again, remember this word in the Greek for tempted and, and tested or trials is the same word, perazzo. And it, it, again, it can mean a testing, it can mean a trial, or it can mean a temptation. And here it's the latter. The context is determining that for us very, very clearly. And here's the point. Trials become temptations when we decide to approach them in our own strength or our own wisdom. Remember we read that God gives wisdom to anyone that asks. But the trials become temptations when we say, I'm going to approach it in my own strength, in my own wisdom, and I'm not going to rely on God. I'm just upset. I'm frustrated. I'm mad. And the real temptation here is to blame God. In this instance, that's the temptation. And let me tell you, for the believer, anytime we give in to temptation, there is some level, there is some part of that whereby we are saying these circumstances are beyond my ability to continue to walk the straight and narrow. They're beyond my ability to continue to pray. It's just too much God, and you should have known this, and now I'm going to move in a different direction. I'm going to be mad. I'm going to shake my fist. I'm going to give in to something here, and it's because of you, because, hey, you're sovereign. You got everything under your control. This shouldn't have happened. You shouldn't have let this happen. This becomes the source of the ultimate temptation, which is, God, you're to blame. That's what, that's, and that's what the world does. That's what the atheist does. Atheist comes to you and says to you, well, I don't believe in God. If there was a God, why is there war? Why is there suffering? Why is there pain? Why is there death? That is the temptation to say that God is the one that does it, and yet James clarifies for us very clearly that God cannot be tempted by evil. So if you want a good definition, if you've taken any kind of notes, Temptation is the enticement or the solicitation to do wrong in any given situation. Temptation is the enticement or the solicitation to do wrong in any given situation. So the trial or whatever comes and there's a fork in the road and there's a solicitation or an enticement that says, go in that direction. Now, that's not God's way, but the solicitation. You know, we, we don't like solicitations. we got a big thing now about phone solicitations. Years ago, several years back, I started getting calls in the middle of the night from somewhere over in the, the Far East. I can't remember now if it was the Philippines or somewhere, but it was not a, a missionary or someone calling me. This was some type of solicitation. Somehow they got my number, and I'm getting a, a, you know, woken up in the middle of the night from, this, from these calls, and uh, I knew that it wasn't anything legit because I do a spam thing and make sure, and it's like, okay, this is spam, but I couldn't stop them from calling. So finally, I had to download a little app onto my phone that basically uh, censors all phone calls that come from this particular area code in this particular part of, uh, again, Philippines, maybe India, and I had to get that block because it was a constant solicitation, and I didn't want that solicitation. So I said, I'm going to put this on my phone and just stop this. Now, God forbid that one day there is a missionary from that area code that's going to want, they're not going to be able to get through to me. They're going to have to call my wife or somebody else. But the solicitation, that's what temptation is. Temptation is the enticement or the solicitation to, to do wrong, to do evil in any given situation. It's not the situation or the circumstance itself that's the temptation. For these people, the temptation is not that they're suffering, that they've lost their jobs. that they've lost. The, the circumstance is not the temptation. The temptation is to try and deal with the circumstance in our own strength and not listen to God and not follow through with God, but instead to blame him and to say, I'm going to go it alone, God. See, it's the inward impulse to do what we know is wrong in the midst of the situation. It's a lure, it's a bait, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a moment, that, that is, is, comes through some attraction that we have. Something that's in us 
There's a lure or a bait that says this is the way to go. Go down this road and don't, don't trust God. Don't believe God. It's the trials are the outward circumstances beyond our control and it's something that we are told to endure by faith. It's interesting that James doesn't say in these trials that these people are going through, some of them very poor, some of them hurting. Isn't it interesting, by the way, that James doesn't say, well, all you got to do is confess this away and it'll all be fine. That's not his, his answer. His answer is seek God, call out to God. God will give you wisdom. God will help you. And remember what he says about these trials, endure them. He doesn't say try and ignore them and pretend they're not there. He says, endure them with the Lord's help because God is going to refine you like gold refined in the fire. God is doing something greater through this testing. So the temptation is not the outward circumstance. The temptation is the inward struggle that involves ungodly desires that need to be resisted when we're facing the trials. That's where the temptation comes. And again, the primary temptation here in James is to blame God for our trouble. Again, that harkens back to don't you dare say that God is the one tempting you because God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. Let's, let's cover this for just a second. This is important for us. So God does not tempt anyone. We cannot say I'm being tempted, by, I'm being tempted to do evil by God. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13 if you remember this, this is the Lord's Prayer, and it's the part of the Lord's Prayer where we pray, lead us not into temptation. Well, there's actually a better way to render that that is a little bit more specific to what the Lord Jesus is telling his disciples in terms of this model prayer, and it's this. Don't let us yield to temptation, because here's the thing. God doesn't lead us into temptation. James makes that clear. So the real point here is when we say, lead us not into temptation, what we're really praying is, Lord, give us the strength not to yield to temptation. Amen. And deliver us not only from evil, but really the evil one. If you really want to know the truth, that's what it said, says in Matthew there um, in, in the original language. So, Lord, give us the strength not to yield to temptation. Help us, O oh Lord, and deliver us from the evil one. So why can't we say God is tempting us? God cannot be tempted, and yours may say, our versions probably say, uh, by, the, the Lord cannot be tempted by evil, but it literally, again, is of evil. And so what that means is, there are two things that are, are going on here. Literally, it means God cannot be tempted by evil, and God cannot be tempted to do evil. He's not tempted by the allure of, of anything evil, and he's not tempted to do evil. It is an impossibility for God. Why? God is just pure. He, he is the righteous one. He is self-existent, the great I am. He, nothing on the outside is getting to God. Not, not one thing. He's, he, everything exists beyond him. And by him, amen, he doesn't exist because of anything else. He can't be thrown off by a bad situation or circumstance. God cannot be tempted by evil. He's not tempted to do evil. And he does not tempt anyone. Let's just say it together. God never tempts. Now say this with me. God never tempts. He never tempts us to do anything evil. He does send tests our way. But he does not send temptation to do evil. Satan is the one that tempts. Amen? Genesis 22.1 does tell us this. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham. God will test us. Matthew 4.1, right after Jesus' um, water baptismal by John the Baptist, we're told this. Jesus was led up. Now get this. He was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Do you see all that? There's a lot there in that verse. The Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness to be tempted, but the temptation came from the devil. So it was, in a sense, a testing. As Jesus, the Son of God, was to begin his earthly ministry, he's going to go through a testing. He's going to go, what you, he's going to go through what you and I go through. That's why the book of Hebrews says that we have a high priest, meaning Jesus, 
who understands, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He understands what we are going through because he has been through the testing and the temptations from the enemy himself. Amen. So he understands all of these things. God tests, but he does not tempt. That is the role of Satan. Now, when we think about temptation, real quick, there are two primary places we can go to, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, where's that first temptation take us back to? What are we reminded of? Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? Here's the temptation. God gives them everything they need, just one tree. Everything else you can have, and it's more than enough for everything you need, supplies everything. The men don't have to shave. I mean, that alone should have been enough. You know, men didn't have facial hair before the fall. That's a result of the fall. That's, you know, shaving is such a hassle. That's why. No, but, but everything was perfect. One tree. Don't partake of this tree. And here comes Satan with the temptation to Eve. But Adam is there. I believe the context is very clear. Adam is right there as well. And he tempts them and they fall. Then we move to the New Testament and I just referenced it for you here in Matthew 4. We've got Jesus as well being led up into the wilderness. And he too is being tempted by Satan. The exact same type of temptation that Adam and Eve went through. And I'll, I'll make that plain for you in a minute because there are three elements to it. The exact same three elements took place with Jesus in the wilderness. But Jesus overcame those temptations. Amen? Here's what we learn about this, is that Satan loves to come in a place of innocence. That's where he always wants to hit. So Adam and Eve were innocent before this took place. Jesus is, is certainly, he's always innocent, but he's innocent. Satan loves to come when we are in a place of innocence. He wants to come in with his words and with his temptations to try and play on that innocence and turn us into people that will listen to his words and will thereby sin. That's what he tries to do. Notice also that both Adam and Eve and Jesus had access to God's word. God had told them very clearly what to do, what his plan was, what his will was. Adam and Eve knew it. Jesus also knew it. Amen. So they both have access to God's word. Then Satan comes in, and if you remember in both instances, what does he try and do when Eve and when Jesus quote the word, what does Satan do? He tries to pervert or change that word around just a little bit. Satan knows the Bible. I'm going to say something to you that's going to shock you, but it's true. Satan knows the Bible better than any one of us here. Hey, I guarantee you, he can quote Genesis 1-1 all the way through to Revelation 22. He can quote it all. He knows it better than we do. And he can misquote it like a champion. And I mean that in a bad way. He knows how to misquote and distort and change the word of God around. I have seen it so many times. I've seen people that are all over the place when it comes to their application of the Bible and they're taking a little bit here and a little bit there and they're throwing it together into a stew. Listen to me. I had some great, wonderful um, stew on New Year's Day. It had a lot of different ingredients in it, but it came out really good. But you cannot take God's word and take a bit here and a bit here and a bit there and put it together and think you're going to get something good. You're not. But that's what Satan does. That's what he did with Adam and Eve. And that's what he tried to do with Jesus. He distorted the word of God in his temptations. And then once that happens, the choice then came to Adam and Eve. And it's come to all of humanity since. And it came to Jesus. We're either going to stand or fall on the basis of what we know and believe as declared to us in God's word by God's spirit. We're either going to live or fall on God versus, well, this other path looks easier. It appeals to me more. This, that's what temptation always boils down to, those two things. And we have to understand that. So God cannot be tempted by evil, verse 13 says, and he himself does not tempt anyone. So that's end of story. Don't blame God. Amen. God is not the source of the temptation. Tomorrow, if they open up a Krispy Kreme donut shop, Right by my house, I cannot say, God, why did you? No. <laughs> All right? So now let's go to verse 14. So now we, we're going to see the source of the temptation and why it works on human beings. But each one is tempted when he or she is carried away and enticed by their own lusts. Each one is tempted when they are carried away. And the word really, again, in the Greek is dragged away. 
when they are dragged away and enticed by their own lusts. What is this language? Does it draw any kind of picture for you here? We had a couple of, uh, of people giving testimony about doing something um, over New Year's Eve and New Year's Day uh, via a boat. <laughs> Fishing. The language here is metaphors that remind me and should remind us of things like fishing and hunting. Because that's what's going on here. That's the type of, of word picture that James is giving to us here. They're depicting a bait that lures the fish or, and the hook or the net that, that would drag it away to destruction. In fishing, the bait is an external force. But the destructive power of sin that James is talking about is actually internal. Satan, we always say Satan tempts us, and that's true, but the, the temptation comes because we have something internally in our flesh, in our nature. Even after we are saved, we still deal with this flesh. There was a doctrine years ago that went around called sinless perfection. That you could get to a place as a Christian and have a, an experience of the Spirit whereby you would never be tempted again and you would live sinlessly, perfect, the rest of your life on this earth. Now that is a, a wonderful thing to aspire to. And God never tempts us and God does give us all we have need of to always say no to temptation and to sin. But the reality is as long as we're on this earth and we're in these bodies, we are going to experience temptation. There's no getting around it. I, and a lot of people, and, and don't raise your hand, but I mean, as a Christian, we would love to just have a mountain cabin up away from everything of this world, right? Just I, I just want to be alone. Just give me a garden up on the mountaintop there where I can get all my food that I need and a fresh stream. And Lord, I can just walk around in the grass and just worship you every day and not have to deal with anything or anyone else. No solicitations. No one knows. I don't. I, that would be great. That's not reality. That is not reality for us. Instead, we are in this place where Satan will throw temptations at us left and right. And then we, because of our nature, are enticed by those temptations. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I just mentioned if you got a Krispy Kreme donut store opening up, that is a temptation to me. If you have the, the vegetable fruit stand, um, we serve uh, cooked onions and, and mushrooms you could set up 10 of them. You're not going to get $1 from me. There's no temptation for me. Maybe for you that is a temptation. For me, it's not a temptation. We all are built a little bit differently and there are different things within us. And here's the deal. Satan knows about each one of us. He knows. He's been able to observe. He's been able to see what works and doesn't work in our lives. And so he will bait the hook accordingly. When you go out fishing, depending on what you are trying to catch, you use different lures, different bait, different things. That's how it works here as well. And it's internal. It's based on you and I yielding to these enticements that are produced by our own pleasure-seeking tendencies. That's how uh, temptation works. Both the enticement and the surrender to it stem from us. It comes from within and again, different situations, different people will give us different uh, ways that Satan will, would come in and different things that we are tempted by. But we all have this sin nature within us and it's a battle and we're going to have to wait until we receive our resurrection bodies before that battle is over. That's just the way it's going to be. Romans 5.12 talks about this. Therefore, as through one man, meaning Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin... So death is now spread to all mankind. Why? Because all have sinned. Raise your hand if you've ever sinned in your life. Raise your hand if you've ever sinned. If you're not raising your hand, you're not, you're not telling the truth. <laughs> all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the Bible, right? So we've all sinned and we are all in need of a Savior and therefore we are also all in this place where we are vulnerable to temptations. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 15, 19, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, acts of adultery, other immoral sexual acts, thefts, false testimonies, and slanderous statements. Okay, so remember I told you a few minutes ago that Satan used three primary enticements on Adam and Eve, and he used the same three basic themes in his temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And I want to share these with you. They're found in 1 John chapter 2. Verses 15 and 16, this is what it says. 
John writes to the church, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, and here it is, the, he says the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, they are of the world. Now, if you go back to Adam and Eve and the temptation that Satan had there with the fruit, we say it's an apple, but we don't really know what fruit it was. But if you remember, as he spoke to Eve and Adam was there listening, it says that she looked at the fruit and she saw that it was good to the eyes. It, it, from what she was told, it should, it should taste good, right? So it's the flesh, the eyes, it looks good, and it's desirable to make her wise, to make her just like God. There is the pride of life. All three things that John summarizes in 1 John 2 is found in the temptation to Adam and Eve. You go to Jesus and it's the same thing. You have all three elements. You have turn these stones into bread. You've been fasting 40 days. Are you guys ready? We're going to go on a 40-day fast. Are you with me? All right. 40 days and we'll be trying to eat the rocks. But you can turn these rocks... Jesus, right? You can turn these rocks into bread. That's the lust of the flesh. I, I need something to satisfy my body. And then he takes him up uh, and shows him the kingdoms of the world. That's the lust of the eyes. If, you, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And then he takes him to the high point of the temple and says, you can jump off. And Psalms tells us that the angels will swoop you up. Make sure you don't dash your foot against a stone. That's, that's Bible. You can do that, Jesus. That's the pride of life. Jesus, go up to the pinnacle of the temple where everyone is assembled, jump off of it, and when you don't crash and burn, everyone's going to know, whoa, here's the Messiah. So we have all three elements. Adam and Eve failed. They surrendered to it, but Jesus did not. This is why our love and our joy and everything is about Jesus. This is why we glorify Jesus. Jesus is the one that beat Satan. He is the one that said no to temptation and became victorious. Amen? Amen. But these are the elements of every temptation. We'll have one or more of these elements. Lust of the flesh. By the way, lust, real quick. When we read, when we read lust in our Bible, that just means strong desire. It doesn't just mean sexual sin. It's just a strong desire. Anything that has a, a strong pull for you, that's kind of lust. That's what it means. It's a strong desire. So the strong desires of the flesh, the strong desires of anything we see, the strong desires of lifting ourselves up. I want people to appreciate me, to love me, to look at me and to think about me well and I, all that stuff. These are where the temptations come from and they don't come from God. He doesn't tempt anyone, but we're told that each one is tempted and they're carried away and enticed by their own desires. It starts within it starts within. And if we follow the pull, folks, of our nature towards this defiance and rebellion against God, then the temptation is going to take us down a road that's going to lead to sin and eventually to spiritual death. But thankfully, we have God by His Spirit. And we are overcomers because He has already overcome and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Everything that Satan can throw at me, everything that my own body and my own desires would throw at me, all of that will come second to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Because he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. So we can win. We can be victorious in him. But we're going to see in verse 15 that it starts in one area and then it becomes full grown into everything else. So let's finish with verse 15 then. So, so we're told in verse 14, each one's tempted when he's carried away or dragged away and enticed by his own lust. And then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished or full grown, it brings forth death. Now, James, he was using the fishing or hunting analogy in verse 14. Now, what analogy is he using here in verse 15? What does this verse 15 make you think of? The language. He's talking about the birth process. He's talking about someone being born and then growing up and eventually dying. So he's talking about the birth process here or the birth comparison to describe how sin works in our lives. So we've got the whole cycle of life here and it is a perfect picture of what happens when we give in to temptation. 
It starts in the mind or in the heart. A little seed is planted. And if that seed is embraced, suddenly it gives birth to something. And what it gives birth to is sin in our life. And if we continue on in that sin, it's like growing up and growing up and becoming an adult. And eventually we think, ah, we've done it. I've got everything I want. We don't realize the hook on the end is death. It's not eternal life, but it's actually death. And so see, the seed of sin is planted and our self-centered desires cause it to conceive something, to bring something forth. It bears a child. And sin is the name of that child. And then it grows into adulthood because it's constantly nourished by self. Instead of dealing with it and pushing it away and repenting of it, it's, it's nourished like a baby. Oh, isn't this so precious? This is so wonderful. It started as just a look. And two people glance and they catch one another's eyes. But the problem is one or both of them are married. Oh, but I've caught that person's eye. That's the first, that's the seed of the temptation. And we already have in the heart the, oh, wait, oh, there's something here. Listen to me. The first thought is not tem- the first thought is the temptation. That is not the sin. It's when we dwell on that and do not deal with it in our thought life and in our heart, immediately saying, no, this is wrong. When we don't deal with that and we nourish it and we allow it to continue, that's when it becomes sin. Those things have to be put away. The, you know, everyone is going to go through something and there's going to be something that's going to come up in their life in a moment of time that, oh, this is, oh. What do I do here? What we do is we surrender to God and we yield to the Lord. We don't give in because the flesh tells us one thing. That's why fasting is so important for Christians. Because when you fast, you're telling the body no and you're telling your spirit, yes, I want to focus in on the Lord. Body, you're not going to get the best of me. Flesh, you're not going to be the one that controls me and drives me and pushes me everywhere I want to go. That's why these things are important. Amen. And so we do these things to not allow the sin to be nourished and to bring forth a child that then grows into full adulthood. And then that that child that comes forth from the adulthood is death. Eventually it becomes death. So conception is the lust that's allowed to stand and the victory or the defeat begins in that opening moment. What are you going to choose to do? The minute you recognize this is Satan, you either continue to listen or you say no more. So the whole thing of the devil made me do it? No. You can't blame the devil. It's not the devil's fault that you or I give in to temptation. It's our fault. Oftentimes, see, we give, we give Satan way too much credit for his tempting powers and we fail to recognize that we're drawn away by our own desires. Oh, if, boy, if it wasn't for Satan... Do you realize that the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth when Satan is bound for a thousand years, you know what's really amazing? At the end of that time, people that have had a thousand years to live in the presence of Christ and to see what the world would be like without the tempter, at the end of those thousand years, you know what happens to the natural people on the earth? You know what they still end up doing? Gathering forces with Satan. As soon as he's let out, they immediately run back to him and say, we're going to attack Jerusalem. We're going to attack the people of God. And they assemble together to try and attack. And that's when God has to just say the end of all of it. But it's an amazing thing. We think if, if you would remove Satan and everything else, then I would be free from the temptation. No, as long as you're in this body, the body is going to constantly be waging war against our spirit. Constantly. And we have to understand that. But there is an out, and this is what I want to close with. 1 Corinthians 10, 10, 13. Every Christian needs to know this or at least have an understanding of it. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is what? Faithful. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able But even in the midst of the temptation, he will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. God will make a way of escape. So look over here. Look above the doors there. What does that say? Exit. Exit. We got one over here. What's it say? Got one I'm looking at behind us. It says exit. God always provides an exit plan for his people. There's, there's, I mean, there are open doors. God says, just come this way and I will deliver you and I will take care of it for you. 
But he gives us the free will and we have to make the choice. But there is always an exit strategy with the Lord. So we stop it at the thought. That's not that's not the that's only the temptation. That's not the birth of sin. It's just the thought life. That's so important. And this is why, by the way, we stay in the word of God. Stay in the word of God because Satan begins with the thought life. And if all we're doing is watching garbage and stuff and listening to other people and yapping on the phone or doing this or that, and we're not in the word of God, then we are cutting off those exit strategies. And we're shutting that down where we're not seeing and understanding and recognizing. So what's the cure? Well, repentance is the cure. You see, the monster has to be destroyed in the cradle, so to speak. Oh, but it's so precious. Oh, but this is so... No, it's a monster. Kill it. This is the one time you, you can... I'm serious. You, you need to kill that thing immediately. Get it done and over with. Do you hear what I'm saying? Folk, the thought, the temptation has to be dealt with immediately. Because it's not from God. It's a monstrosity. It's a Frankenstein. Deal with it. Kill it immediately. But here's the quick problem. We're going to finish, but here's the problem. You know what the problem is? So few speeding um, uh, laws are broken when it comes to fleeing from temptation. That's the one time we don't break, break the speeding law. That's the one time we should. Every other time, if it's a temptation, a lot of people, oh, man, they, they, they're going as fast as they can when God says, no, turn the car around and then hit the gas and go in the opposite direction. If you're going to break the speeding law, do it by running away from sin. Amen? Amen. That's, when we, that's the one time you can break the speeding law spiritually. It's when you're moving in the opposite direction from the temptation, but so few people do that. Instead, you know what they end up doing? They end up slowing down. Oh, well, I, I know I should turn the car around. Well, I'm just going to slowly turn it around, but I'm, I'm looking. Oh, yeah. Oh. No, man. <laughs> turn that thing around and hit the gas and go. Amen. Are you with me? I'm serious. This is the issue. Don't come to a crawl and a stop when you're dealing with sin. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So real quickly, and I'm going to finish up with this, but real quick. So if the temptation is some desire or strong um, uh, feeling from, from our body, if our body or our mind or our heart is saying one thing, but we know it's not right, what do we do? I'm going to give you just a couple of scriptures and now pay attention to these. And then at the end of these, you tell me what the common denominator is. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. 2 Timothy 2.22, now flee from youth, youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 2 Peter 1.4, through all these precious promises, God has given uh, uh, precious and magnificent promises God has given to us so that by them we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world on account of lust, all right, so the first three have a particular word. The fourth one is saying the same thing without using the word. I'm going to give you one Old Testament example, and then you're going to tell me what the common denominator is. Remember Joseph when he was in Potiphar's house? And Potiphar's wife came on to him and said, come and sleep with me. Joseph, he had full run of the house. Potiphar's wife is saying, look, my husband's never going to find out about this. Just come and sleep with me. It's, it's going to be okay. And he's advancing. Joseph is advancing and getting out of the, the dungeon in the pit. And he's, he's like second in command in this castle, so to speak. But do you remember what Joseph does? As she grabs on to him, she literally grabs... You know, sometimes it's the woman. It's not always the man. I know probably 90% we say it's the man. Every once in a while it's the woman. She grabs hold of him and what does he do? Oh, does he flee? Did, did he leave? Oh, he did. So what's the common denominator in all of these instances when it comes to this thing? How do we deal with temptation? What's the, what's the word? We flee. Flight. Listen to me. Flight is the answer for all of these things. Immediately, full stop, turn around, boom, I'm gone. That's always the answer. There is no other. Oh, but God is causing me. He wants me to grow stronger. So I'm going to hang out here a little bit longer. And I know eventually the spirit will kick in and I'll say no, but I'm okay. I can show you. No, 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 no. Run, turn, run, flee, get away as quick as you can. 
That's always the answer. Amen? Every single time. That's the only Bible answer to temptation is flight. And I'm going to finish with the other temptation, which is the temptation of suffering here that these people are going through. And the temptation to blame God. What do we do in these instances? We do what Job did. Job had his world crash in on him. He wasn't given the insight that you and I as readers are given when we read that opening chapter of Job and we see Satan there saying, hey, give me Job. Let me take everything from Job and you'll see that he'll curse you. Job doesn't know any of this. Instead, he's got these so-called friends that come in and tell him, well, you clearly sinned. You clearly, you did something wrong. Because if you're not sinning, then it's only good things that happen to Christians. There's no suffering. There's nothing bad that ever happens, right? That was their philosophy. No. Job, at the end of the book, surrendered back to God. I, I'm yours. You are God. I'm not. And the Lord comes in at the end and says, you're right. I'm God and you're not. And God doesn't even tell Job the whole story about Satan. And I, Job doesn't even know and it doesn't matter because God says it's okay. And Job says, yes, it is okay. You're the creator. And I know you're in charge and you're going to take care of me. And when we are going through suffering, do not be tempted to blame God. Instead, put your faith and your trust in him and know that he's going to carry you through the storm. That's what we have to do. And we'll learn that a little bit more even as we move forward next week. But I want you to remember these things. Fully trust in him. Brother Ivor, if you would come. I'm going to finish with 2 Peter 2 and verse 9. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. God knows how to deliver the godly out of trials and temptations, same word, and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. If you're going through something right now and you, it's just not just, it's not right, it's not can't, give it to God. Amen. Put your trust and your confidence in Him. He's going to take care of everything. At the end of the day, God's going to take care of all of it. Amen? He just calls us to endure. And to trust him. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time tonight. Lord, I ask that these words will have encouraged us. Lord, there are general temptations that all of us will face on a regular, maybe almost daily timeline. Just all, just constantly, we're going to face certain temptations. We have to say no. We have to flee from those things. And then there are also times where there's suffering in our lives. And we're going to be tempted to say that you've caused it or you've put us in this situation to tempt us to do something evil and it's on you, not us. No, you are not tempted by evil and you don't tempt anyone to do evil. The temptation comes from the enemy and it plays upon our own flesh, our own human desires. And we recognize that. And instead, Lord, we're not going to allow that temptation to become to give birth to sin because eventually that leads to death. Nothing good comes from that. Instead, we're going to say no to those things. And we're going to worship you, the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation, no shadow of turning. You are consistent, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we put our confidence in you, not in our circumstances, not in our situations, not in times of suffering, not in times of, of tremendous trials. We're not going to turn from you. We're going to endure through Jesus Christ, for he has overcome and we are overcomers in him. Minister to this truth to your people as we start into a new year. We love you. We thank you. And I'm believing you for great things. In Jesus' mighty name, I ask this. Amen and amen.